Peter says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. As Christians, Peter, he doesn't tell us what to say or how to go about giving an account of our hope. That's up to us. But he just says, be ready to give an account. And being as I'm the one up here this morning speaking, I'll give an account of my hope. It changes every time I have to give it. A lot to do, a lot on how I give an account of my hope is how much time do I have to say, you know, what I base my hope in. It could be just a passing at work. Someone says, well, Jim, why are you a Christian? Why do you believe what you believe? I mean, what's your hope? I might have just less than a minute to say it. I say, well, I believe that Jesus Christ came down to this earth. And he lived that perfect life, that sinless life. And then he allowed himself to go to that cross and shed his blood. And it's that blood that covers my sins. So I have a home in heaven. That's it. That's good enough, right? But let's say, well, I have more time. Like this morning, I have 20 to 40 minutes, whatever it is. I'm shooting for a half hour. I have no idea, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So someone might ask, Jim, hey, what's your hope? Why are you a Christian? Okay, I base my hope right here in the Word of God. This book, this number one bestseller year after year, that's what I base my hope in, right? Here we find the characteristics of God, right? In here, I believe, in here is the moral compass of the world. Mankind has tried to get rid of this ever since it came out. Why? Because without this, people have permission they can lie cheat steal and even kill whatever it takes to get ahead, to get ahead in this life but this keeps the world in check okay uh, I believe right here this is what gives us direction on how to get to heaven our hope right here now someone might say well Jim what makes you think this book the Bible is God's word well when someone asks that there's like three different directions I could go, okay? The first direction that comes to my mind is my son-in-law and I just got done taking a course. And it was in uh, basically all the, the evidences of God, all the evidences that are in this Bible. A lot of it was science. It was called, you know, the science, uh, scientific facts or scientific foreknowledge, okay? Scientific foreknowledge, meaning there's stuff in this Bible that the Bible writers wrote down hundreds and thousands of years that the writers knew before modern scientists, human beings, ever figured out, like, wow, how did they know that way back then, right? Now, I don't choose to go down that road right now. My son-in-law would. He's a little smarter than me. I need to take the class again, all right? All right. There's another direction I could go. All the things that were wrote in this Bible thousands of years ago, there's things wrote in this Bible that predicted world history. And they came true. Not 70% of the time, not 90% of the time, 100% of the time. Okay? Those predictions, a lot of you call them prophecies. Okay? I mean, Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 prophecies alone about himself. How many of us for example, had anything to do with what city we're going to be born in? No, but it was, it was prophesied that Jesus would be born in the town of Bethlehem, and he was, right? Okay, the direction I like to go down, because it's simpler for me, I just like to talk about the Bible itself on how we got it. Okay, 40 different authors... 40 different authors over a 15 to 1600 year period, give or take. We're doing big numbers here. If you want specifics, ask someone like Kevin or Todd, and they'll get right down and they'll tell you. But say, say 1600 years, 40 different authors, right? They all wrote different books of the Bible. There's 66 different books in this Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, okay? They all wrote about one thing, Jesus Christ. The Old Testament somebody's coming. The New Testament, the first four books, the Gospels, somebody's here, and the rest of the New Testament, somebody's coming again, okay? 
Now, what's significant about that, 40 different authors over that long of a period with one subject, all those, all those individual books, they come together just like this. They come together and they complement one another. They even speak of one another, right, without one contradiction. Now, how is that possible? It's not possible unless this Bible is the Word of God. Okay? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God. Meaning, there's not one word that went, that went into this Bible that God didn't want to go into that Bible. Right? Even though he used 40 different human men that brought pen to paper or pen to parchment or pen to animal skins, right? He directed every word. Right? If he didn't, just like I said, they could get rid of the Bible. They've been looking for problems in the Bible ever since it came out because if they can find uh, discrepancies, well, then they can get rid of it and everybody has permission to lie, cheat, steal, kill, whatever it takes, right? But they can't do it because it's the Word of God. All right. There's another thing I like to talk about the Bible. Of all the knowledge that's in it, okay? The amount of knowledge that's in this Bible... There's a story. There's a story in all four of the Gospels it's talk, talked about. I'll just paraphrase from John 6. All right. Jesus is in this desolate area, and the, the multitude follows him. Why? Because he's healing the sick, right? He's healing the sick, and, he, and he's preaching, and he's a good preacher. People are hanging on every word, right? So Jesus is there. He's preaching the kingdom. And the Bible tells us there's 5,000 men alone, not counting the women and children, right? So as the evening approaches, his disciples say to him, Hey, Jesus, send the people away. Let them get going to town because they're getting hungry. And Jesus looks out in the crowd, and like always, Jesus always feels compassion. And he looks at them, and he turns to his disciples, and he says, Hey, what do we have for them to eat? His disciples say, Jesus, look at the size of that crowd, right? Look at the size of that crowd. What are you talking about? He goes, just take a look. What do we got? Well, they took a look. They said, Jesus, we've got five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus says, okay, give it to me. And he blesses it, and he breaks the bread, and he says, okay, tell everybody to sit down. And he says, okay, now start passing it out. And the disciples start passing it out. And they're passing it out, and they're passing it out. Before long... Everybody is fed and full. And then Jesus says, okay, pick up the leftovers, and there's 12 baskets full of bread and fish. Okay? Now, in that chapter of John, in chapter 6, Jesus says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Meaning, food for the stomach? No. We're talking about the knowledge of the Bible. Every time you go to the Bible, you get more knowledge. You could be the biggest or the best Bible scholar that's ever lived, right? You've been studying the Bible for 65 years. You open it up, you dig in, you close it, and you say, man, I just learned something. You open her up, you dig in, and you say, I've studied that chapter for the, you know, 30 times, and I just learned something again. Well, how is that possible? Because it's the Word of God. Just like that bread and those fish lasted until everybody was full, it was never ending, just like the knowledge in this book. It's never ending because it's the Word of God. Okay, I also believe that this gives us direction, direction to heaven. That's our hope. That's what we're talking about. Our hope is in heaven. Anything we do in life, anything at all, we need direction, right? You always need direction. Well, this Bible shows us direction. I got a corny story. It sounded good laying in bed. <laughs> All right. An uncle comes to me and he says, Jim, you've always been my favorite. And I'm like, naturally, uncle, I understand that. And he says, look, here's a key. He says, you take this key and you take this key to this town. That's somewhere, it's located somewhere in the United States. I never heard about it. And he says, you take this key, you go to the bank, okay? And you hand this key to the bank teller, and she's going to go, she's going to unlock a safety deposit box. Inside that box, there's a million dollars that I'm giving to you, okay? All right? Okay, my uncle's giving me a million bucks, right? At that time, am I a millionaire? No. 
At that time, I'm the owner of a key, right? So, so I run home and I jump in my car and I haul her off to Kinder. Kinder, get in. And do we just start aimlessly driving east? No, we're going to look at a map. How do I get to that town so I get my million dollars, right? It's the same way on how do we get to heaven. We go to God's word to find the directions, right? Now you might say, Jim, the Bible's so big. It's, so, it's too hard to understand. Where would I start? Well, I'm going to break it down this morning real easy, okay? I'm going to break it down real easy. This, this Bible of mine, inside it, 66 books, okay? 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, right? My Bible, same as yours, it might, be, it might vary in pages because mine has more pictures, my font might be a little bigger, but roughly, here it is. My Bible's a little over 1,800 pages, right? And then granted, that is a big book, right? Because our mission this morning is we want to know the directions to heaven. How do we get there? That's our hope. That's what we're after this morning. Okay, 1,800 pages. Now watch. I'm going to break it down for us. There it is. You see that? See the difference? This side's the Old Testament, right? 39 books. It's a great read. There's all kinds of things that we can apply to our lives, right? It's great. But here's the New Testament. Right here is over 1,300 pages, the Old Testament. We're in a hurry right now. We want to, we, we, like we could get ran over by a Mack truck, so we want to know, hey, how do I get to heaven? All right? 1,300 pages. It's over 1,300 pages. This side is 508. 508 pages. We're going to concentrate on this side right now, right? Now you might say, well, Jim, still, that's 508 pages. Where do I start? Okay? Where do I start? Well, I recommend reading one of the first four books in the New Testament. They're called the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Okay, take one of them. You'll read about the life of Jesus when he's on this earth and ultimately going to that cross and shedding his blood. You can read one of them in a couple hours. But, if you want to find the directions on how to be a Christian, how to be converted into Christianity, this is where we go, right here. Okay? We started off with over 1,300 pages. No, we started, yes, over 1,800 pages. Right here, 58 pages, 28 chapters, one book, the book of Acts, meaning the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, or you could call it the book of conversions. Nowhere else in the Bible are you going to find examples of people becoming a Christian. Okay, you said, what are you talking about, Jim? Well, here, in the Old Testament, okay, the first 1,300 pages in this Bible, Jesus hasn't even shed his blood on that cross yet. Okay, well, the New Testament, you go, wait a minute, Jim. Acts is only the fifth book in the New Testament. There's got to be more conversions later on. There's, what, 22 more books left? No, not for an example on how the steps, the plan of salvation. That's not where I would go. See, why do I say that? Well, the book after Acts is called Romans. And then you have 1st, 2nd Corinthians. Then you have Galatians, Ephesians, right, and so forth. What that is, the book of Romans is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church in Rome meaning they're already Christians, okay? He's writing them a letter to give them instructions on how to conduct your lives now that you're a Christian, right? But if you're looking for an example of someone getting converted into Christianity, it's not there. First and Second Corinthians, that's a letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth, okay? They're already Christians. Galatians, the letter to the church in Galatia. Ephesians, the letter to the church in Ephesus. You get, you get what I'm saying, right? So we're going to stick with the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, right, this is the start. This is after Jesus has died and resurrected and went to heaven. This book of Acts, now 58 pages, covers roughly the first 30 years of church history. Okay? Okay? That's less than a year a page. It's a fast read. In here we'll find 11 different examples on how to get in contact with that blood so we have a hope in heaven. That's our mission.
So we're going to start in Acts 2. If you want to start right there, we're going to go to Acts 2. This is Peter. He's doing the very first sermon at the start of the New Testament church. And at this time, Peter is inspired by the Holy Spirit because, see, he doesn't have the New Testament to refer from. So the Holy Spirit is guiding Peter, right, with words, right? Just like nowadays, we do have the written New Testament. And, but remember, the Holy Spirit guided all these words, so it's the same thing, okay? We read from the inspired word. Well, Peter's getting a miracle. He's inspired now miraculously, and he's given the first sermon, okay? So as he's winding down his sermon, everybody's looking up at him. And in verse 36, Peter says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now, wh when they heard that, like, what? That guy that we nailed to the cross, that we had nailed to the cross, that was him? That was the Messiah? Peter says, yeah, yeah, you crucified him. You didn't recognize him, right? Well, look, the next verse, verse 37, they said, Now, when they heard this, they were pierced through the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? I mean, that was him? We killed him? Well, what do we do now, Peter? Well, notice what Peter says in verse 38. He says, Hey, now that you believe, you're good. You're good. You believe. You don't have to do nothing. Is that what he says? No. They asked Peter, what do we do now? Peter says, verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, each one of you. Turn your thinking around. You want to be a Christian? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. He tells them, hey, you killed him. You believe now. That was Jesus. That was the Messiah. What do you do now? Repent and be baptized for forgiveness of your sins. Hey, we got some steps to salvation right there, right? Drop down to verse 41. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. Added to what? They were added to the church at that point. You don't join the church, right? Right? It's simple. You... God adds you right there to the book of life, right? And you say, well, okay, Jim, okay, that's one example. Well, let's skip ahead. Let's go to Acts 8. We're going to read about another character in the Bible. His name is, he's going to be the Ethiopian eunuch, okay? And we're going to start about verse 26. Okay. Reading from verse 26, chapter 8 of Acts. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Okay? It's a, de it's a desert road. Verse 27. So he got up. Philip gets up. And he went there. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official. Okay? Drop down to verse 28. And he, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, he was returning and sitting in his, in his chariot and reading from the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Hey, go up and join his chariot. All right, so that, this, 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 this Ethiopian eunuch was reading right what Steve talked about this morning from the prophet Isaiah, and he's going to be reading from, from chapter 53. Okay, so Philip, he runs up, and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, verse 30, and he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? Could you imagine you're reading a book, or specifically you're, you're reading out of the Isaiah uh, the prophet, and someone comes up to you, do you understand what you're reading? How insulting, huh? Huh? But at any rate, what does is, what is, what is the Ethiopian eunuch says? Verse 31, he says, Well, how could I? Unless someone guides me, right? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. All right. Hop, hop. He, Philip hops up there, and he's going to explain what he's reading, right? Verse 32, Now the passage of Scripture, which he was reading, was this. He was led, to, uh, led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation, for his life is removed from the earth? Now, verse 34, the eunuch says, Philip, please tell me of whom this prophet says this, of him 
or someone else. Verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. All right? So Philip preaches Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, so he's preaching Jesus. Now watch this. The very next verse. Verse 36, And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look! With an explanation mark. Look! Water! Another explanation mark. I mean, this guy's excited. Philip started preaching Jesus to him, and all of a sudden the eunuch's saying, Look at there! Look! There's water! Right? And he asked, What prevents me from being baptized? So what do we, what do we get from there? Well, Philip, he was preaching Jesus to him, but this eunuch's awful excited over that water that he sees. We know well, he's preaching baptism at the same time, right? So he asked Philip, what prevents me from being baptized? The very next verse, verse 37, Philip says, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answers him, and uh, the eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a confession. He just confesses, I believe in the Son of God, Right? Okay, and he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. And notice that, they both went down into the water. And Philip just didn't say, well, hang tight, there's water. I'll grab a cup, you wait here, and I'll go get a cup of water. No, no, they both went down into the water, okay? And when they come, uh, and, and then the eunuch was baptized. Verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no long, long, longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. All right, so there's two accounts right there, two accounts. We got uh, Peter, he taught them, right? He taught the Jews there in Acts 2. Well, Philip taught the eunuch here in Acts 8. So they've been taught. Well, in Acts 2, they were pierced through the heart when they realized that was him. Now they believe that Jesus, that was the Lord and Savior. Yep, okay, so they believed. Well, the eunuch just got taught by Philip. He believes right? Peter, when asked, what shall we do? Repent. So now we know you got to repent. Well, the eunuch asked Philip, huh? What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, hey, do you believe Jesus Christ the son of, is, is the Son of the living God? He did. That's a confession. So now we have some steps to the plan of salvation, right? Okay. Well, you might say, yeah, Jim. Okay, that's great. But I'm a Christian. I prayed to God. And I let Jesus come into my heart. And that's when I became a Christian, right? Well, we do have a story in the book of Acts of someone praying, okay? Someone praying. And we're going to read that account, okay? We're going to read from chapter 9, and it's going to be the account of the Apostle Paul himself and his conversion. But then we're going to jump to chapter 22 and it's going to be the same account but it's going to be Paul himself talking about his conversion okay okay now before the apostle Paul was converted his name was Saul okay they're the same person I don't want that to throw you but let's just start chapter 9 of Acts and let's start in verse 1 now Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest. And he asked for letters from, the, from him to the synagogues at Damascus. Paul, uh, Saul, he asked for these letters. Well, these letters are warrants, warrants to arrest Christians. See, Saul, he wants to put an end to this Christianity stuff. He thinks he's working for the Lord. I mean, he is zealous to get rid of this Christianity stuff, right? So, he asked for these letters. All right, verse 3, And as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Could you imagine? Whoa! Huh? And then he hears a, a, a voice out of heaven, Why are you persecuting me? It's like, huh? Uh-oh, right? Okay, verse 5, and he said, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I mean, if you're persecuting Christians, you're persecuting the church, guess what? You're persecuting me. 
Could you imagine what Saul is thinking right now? Right? He's on the ground going, oh, no. Right? All right. Verse 6. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told what you must do. So the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he couldn't see nothing. And leading him by the hand, he was brought into Damascus. Can you imagine? Saul. This guy, he was scary, right? And he was a proud man, but all of a sudden now, he's been blinded. He's been hit between the eyes by Jesus himself, and now he's being led by the hand, right? He has been humbled. Now get this, verse 9. He went into the town, and he was there three days without sight, and he's neither eating or drinking. This guy has been shaken to the core. He's wondering why his life hasn't been snuffed out right there, right? He's not even eating or he's not, he's not drinking, right? And Okay, verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Okay, Saul's praying. He's not eating. He's not drinking. I mean, what do you think this guy is praying for? He is praying like, I am sorry. I get it. I'm sorry. He is repent, repenting like you've never seen before, right? Okay, well, let's go to chapter 22 now. This is going to be the Apostle Paul talking about his conversion. And we're going to start verse 6. 22 verse 6. But it happened that I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime. A very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven and all around me. And I fell to the ground and I heard, heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, who you, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all that has been appointed for you to do. Okay? But since I could not see, he's been blinded, right, by the light. He was led by the hand, and he came into Damascus. Now, verse 12. A certain Ananias, a man who was a devout by the standard of the law and well spoken by the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up at him, and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one, and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Okay, now think about it. Saul's there. Now he's got his sight. He hasn't been eating. He hasn't been drinking. He's been nothing but praying. Okay? I mean, he's been shaken to the core. He's been praying. He's been repenting all this time. Right? If a prayer could save you, Paul, uh, Paul would be, or Saul would be saved at that time. Now, what does Ananias say to him in verse 16? Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Hey, now, wait a minute. What do you mean? His sins were forgiven when he was praying, right? Just like you might think you let Jesus into your heart, maybe saying the sinner's prayer. No, Ananias says, now, Saul, you've been praying for three days. Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name so there you go that is my hope okay my hope is that Jesus came to this earth and he shed his blood on this cross and I get my directions right here from the Bible well how do I get in contact with that blood okay okay I know. Yeah, we all know. He shed his blood. But it's just like that million dollars that's sitting in that bank account for my uncle. It's mine. It's a gift. But I have to get myself there to receive it. Just like the blood of Jesus, it's a free gift. 
but I've got to get into it, right? And the steps that, the, we, that we have just seen in the book of Acts, the conversions, you have to be taught, okay? You have to believe, right? You have to repent and then confess, and then you are baptized, and then you are added to the book of life right at that point. So if you're here this morning and you want to make a change and you want to be in contact with that blood, you have an opportunity. We can make it happen. Won't you make it known as we stand and sing the invitation song? Yeah.